In the year 1966, this nation's manned spaceflight activities in Gemini are focused on manned flight operations. And in Apollo, they are focused on qualification and development testing, manufacturing, facility activation, and unmanned flight operations. In every area, major objectives were achieved during the first three months of 1966. In Gemini flight operations, work to prepare the way for Apollo continued. And in Gemini 8, the program's first mission for the year, the primary purpose was to accomplish a rendezvous and docking between the spacecraft and an Agena target vehicle. Rendezvous and docking is a major Gemini program objective, and it is a vital maneuver in the Apollo lunar mission. Another purpose for the mission was to perform considerable extravehicular work, further establishing man's ability to function in space. On the morning of March 16th, the Agena target vehicle was launched precisely on schedule. Both the Atlas booster and the Agena propulsion system performed properly, and a near-perfect orbit was obtained. One hour and 41 minutes after the first liftoff, Gemini 8, with astronauts Armstrong and Scott, was launched. Again, a near-perfect orbit was attained. Coincidentally, the world's first liquid-fueled rocket was launched 40 years ago to the day by Dr. Robert H. Goddard at Auburn, Massachusetts, and it reached an altitude of 184 feet. After a complex series of maneuvers similar to those of the Gemini 7-6 mission in December, Gemini 8 achieved its planned rendezvous at 161 miles above the Earth. It was 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time when the flight crew reported visual contact with the Agena. Gemini 8 closed within 150 feet and flew in a station-keeping formation for the next 35 minutes. At 6.15 p.m., Gemini 8 completed the docking maneuver, the first in history. The vehicles remained docked in a stable condition for 41 minutes, until now a flawless mission. It was then, however, that the Gemini-Agena combination suddenly began a severe roll and yaw motion. Astronaut Armstrong disengaged the Gemini 8 spacecraft, and to bring it under control, he was forced to use the re-entry control system. Post-flight investigation revealed that the problem resulted from a malfunction that caused a spacecraft thruster to fire out of control. Subsequently, termination of the mission was ordered. The spacecraft was to re-enter into a planned contingency recovery area in the Pacific, approximately 500 miles east of Okinawa. Department of Defense Recovery Forces immediately deployed. The Gemini 8 astronauts initiated retrofire and began re-entry. They followed the program trajectory so closely, they touched down within two miles of the planned impact point, closer than in any previous Gemini flight. Some three hours after touchdown, the spacecraft was taken aboard the USS Mason. The major program objective of rendezvousing and docking in space was achieved, a substantial step closer to the Apollo manned lunar and other advanced space missions. Further, the performance of ground forces, including flight controllers and recovery teams, was shown to be outstanding in an emergency situation, and contingency planning was proven to be sound. Future Gemini missions will be devoted to investigating other methods of rendezvousing and docking and to perfecting operational skills such as extravehicular activity. For the Apollo Lunar Mission Space Vehicle, qualification and development of hardware were marked by milestones, both for the spacecraft and for the Saturn V launch vehicle. One of the milestones was reached at the Army's White Sands Missile Range where the Apollo launch escape system became flight qualified. The rocket-powered system is designed to separate the spacecraft command module from the space vehicle and propel it to safety in the event of an abort situation on the pad or in early powered flight. Launch vehicle was the Little Joe II, which was used to place the test command modules and escape systems into launch abort conditions. 
The flight in which qualification was attained was conducted on January 20th, 1966. It was designed to impose the worst possible abort conditions anticipated for Apollo. The Little Joe II launch vehicle lifted off shortly after 8 a.m. Some 70 seconds later, the launch vehicle performed a planned pitch up, causing the command module to tumble upon separation. Launch escape system canards successfully stabilized the command module, then the system separated. The three parachutes deployed and returned the module to Earth, and the launch escape system was declared qualified for manned missions. Another test effort, this one by Grumman Aircraft, concluded the studies of the lunar module landing gear's performance in simulated lunar landings on various types of surfaces. For these tests, a one-sixth scale lunar module descent stage was dropped onto an inclined table covered with soft sand. The impacts were recorded in extreme slow motion for engineering study. For all surfaces used in the tests, landing gear designs were proven adequate. For the Saturn V launch vehicle, one of the most important phases of the second stage propulsion system development was completed by North American Aviation on March 15th. It consisted of a series of static firings of the propulsion system, which was installed in a battleship or heavy weight stage structure designed to withstand repeated testing. The final firing, the fifth of the quarter, lasted 360 seconds and raised the total accumulated firing time to 1,868 seconds. It also marked the completion of all battleship stage development testing for Saturn V. Another ground test series, one of the most important in the development of Saturn V, is aimed at assuring proper performance of the launch vehicle's liquid-fueled third stage in space. In this series, the Marshall Space Flight Center acquired data on liquid fuel behavior during weightlessness. This was done by dropping free fall model tanks containing liquid and photographing in slow motion the behavior of the liquid. The film data are now undergoing engineering study and analysis. Preparations for another ground test series began at the Air Force Arnold Engineering Development Center, Tullahoma, Tennessee, where a third stage engine and other equipment were delivered for static firings and a test facility was being modified. The objective of the series is to acquire additional performance data on the engine at a simulated altitude of 100,000 feet or in near vacuum conditions. With ground testing work progressing rapidly for Apollo Saturn V, manufacturing moved steadily forward for flight vehicles. And manufacturing work for the first flight Apollo Saturn V is now approaching completion. At the Marshall Space Flight Center, the first flight vehicle's first stage, which has a thrust of seven and a half million pounds, successfully underwent its acceptance test firings in January. It is scheduled for delivery to the Kennedy Space Center during the summer. At North American Aviation, the second stage was in systems installation with assembly scheduled for completion in the immediate future. At Douglas Aircraft, the third stage was being prepared for its initial acceptance firing. At IBM, the instrument unit was undergoing component installation and completion was scheduled for the near future. And at North American Aviation, the first flight command and service modules for Apollo Saturn V were in final assembly, undergoing systems installation. Concurrent with hardware testing and manufacturing, Apollo facilities were becoming operational. One of the most important of these is the Mississippi Test Facility, which will be used for acceptance firings of the Saturn V first and second stages for flight vehicles. The facility comprises an engineering and industrial support area, a major transportation network, and the test stand complex. For the engineering and industrial support area, construction was finished for many buildings, and the NASA contractor team has been assembled. The principal contractors include General Electric, 
Boeing, and North American. A primary part of the transportation network is the waterways system, which was nearing completion. Barges are used for transporting the stages and supercold fuels to test stands. There are three test stands. The first is a dual test stand, which can accommodate two Saturn V first stages simultaneously. At the end of March, superstructure steelwork was nearing completion, and ancillary equipment was being installed. Once complete, the stand will tower 19 stories high. Another test stand, to be used for firing second stages, was undergoing erection of superstructure and installation of ancillary equipment. The final stand, which will also be used for testing second stages, was ready for the first static firing at the Mississippi Test Facility. The stage, an all-systems ground test vehicle, had been installed and pre-firing checkouts were underway in preparation for the test early in the second quarter of 1966. After the first and second stages for Saturn V flight vehicles have been acceptance fired at the Mississippi Test Facility, they will be delivered to the Kennedy Space Center's Launch Complex 39. This facility, too, was becoming operational. In the Vehicle Assembly Building, which can be used for checking out and mating up to four Apollo Saturn V space vehicles simultaneously, both the high and low bay areas were essentially complete, and ground support equipment was being installed. The 250-ton crane in the high bay area was declared operational and was first used in installing service arms on the launching tower. In the launch control center, which is adjacent to the vehicle assembly building, console racks had been installed in three of the four firing rooms, and console components were being installed in firing room one. Meanwhile, the crawler transporter passed a series of operational tests. In January, the vehicle was used to lift and transport a mobile launcher into the vehicle assembly building. And in March, it was used to transport the mobile launcher up the 5% grade approach to launch pad A, thus passing a critical test of the hydraulic leveling system. Nearby at launch pad B, construction moved toward a summer completion date. Also during the quarter, the Apollo Saturn V facility's checkout vehicle was delivered by NASA and contractors to Complex 39, and by the end of March, the three stages and instrument unit of the Saturn V had been mated in the assembly building's high bay area. The facility test vehicle, the first complete Apollo Saturn V ever assembled, is being used for checkouts of equipment, facilities, and handling procedures. In facilities, as well as hardware for Apollo Saturn V, the nation drew steadily nearer the manned lunar mission capability. In the meantime, at the Kennedy Space Center's Complex 34, the major manned spaceflight milestone for 1966 was reached. This was the first launch for Apollo Saturn 1B, the beginning of a major new phase in Apollo flight operations. The Apollo Saturn 1B is the space vehicle for the first manned Apollo missions which will be flown in Earth orbit. Its liquid oxygen, liquid kerosene first stage built by Chrysler is similar to the original Saturn I first stage, but it has a lighter weight structure and almost 7% greater thrust, 1,600,000 pounds. The liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen second stage built by Douglas Aircraft is totally new. It has a thrust of 200,000 pounds, greater than any previously flown hydrogen-oxygen stage. Powered by the J-2 engine, it is the same as the third stage of Saturn V. The instrument unit, built by IBM, is similar to the one for the original Saturn I and almost identical to the instrument unit for the Saturn V. This one was the first flight model built by the contractor. The spacecraft, manufactured by North American Aviation, consists of command and service modules and is the first flight model equipped with systems. The objectives for the first launch, an unmanned suborbital mission, included verifying the operation of the ground support facilities, the compatibility and performances of the launch vehicle and spacecraft, and the ablative characteristics of the spacecraft heat shielding. For the countdown, Launch Complex 34 provides the capability for almost completely automatic checkouts and furnishes more comprehensive test data in shorter time. 
Following a successful countdown, liftoff came at 11.12 a.m., February 26th. The first stage functioned according to design. It cut off after two and one half minutes, completing a successful first phase of the flight. The second stage, shown here by a film from an onboard camera, ignited and burned for over seven minutes. Guided by the instrument unit, it placed the spacecraft into the proper trajectory, culminating a highly successful performance by the launch vehicle. The trajectory had an apogee, or high point, of well over 300 miles. After spacecraft launch vehicle separation, the spacecraft propulsion system burned twice, a verification of its stop-start capability. It propelled the command module back into the atmosphere at a speed of more than 27,000 feet per second. This imposed re-entry conditions more severe than in either Mercury or Gemini and provided data important for the lunar mission re-entry. The spacecraft command module impacted some 5,000 miles downrange in the South Atlantic near Ascension Island and was recovered by the USS Boxer. During the mission, the spacecraft systems functioned within design specifications, although the propulsion system performance was somewhat irregular. Although the spacecraft heat shielding experienced greater ablation than expected in three spots, it prevented interior temperatures from exceeding 90 degrees and design modifications are underway to prevent excessive ablation in the future. The first Apollo Saturn 1B flight was an important step toward the next major milestone, the first manned Apollo mission, for which the flight crew has already been selected. It is accomplishments such as those in Apollo Saturn 1B, as well as in Apollo Saturn 5 and in Gemini, that have established in manned spaceflight a pattern of progress. And it is this pattern of progress that continues to increase confidence that this nation's goals in space will be attained.